There's a common complaint I hear in sports discussions, an attempt to distinguish narrative from the game itself. And on the flip side of the same coin, the most common complaint about sports movies is the overdramatic approach to a game, heightening something already so narratively fulfilling into story beats codified by Hollywood. As a film critic, films about athletes and the games they play will always appeal to me. The key distinction here is in the medium. Sports are television, and sports movies are, well, cinema. Sports may take place live, but they exist on television, and even more increasingly online. The live tweet reactions to games and news are on par with those of fictional or quote-unquote fictional TV events like a White Lotus or Bachelor finale. The narratives last throughout seasons and climax after months of anticipation before an off-season. Talking head shows create a daytime TV economy out of the nighttime events. The recurring characters, cameos, crossovers, and the multicam visual style all lock sports into a televisual format. On the other hand, the key to sports cinema is extracting what is so rewarding about those narratives and transposing them to film. The reason none of my favorite sports movies are based on true stories is that those true sports narratives transcend television and they feel more mythical than anything else. You know, I'm also not dying for a film adaptation of the myth of Sisyphus, you know? It's just too big of an idea for a two-hour movie. Movies are instead a place to explore the ideas that sports bring up. They're the philosophical locker room tape session, if you will. Dramatic human themes like addiction and lust and personal legacy are on the line, grander ideas about individualism versus team camaraderie, the class struggle inherent in an owner-player system, identity beyond your professional accomplishments, the joy of childlike play, and the passage of time itself all on the table in sports movies. You know, they're not going to explore these ideas on first take. And finally, guitar, I must yes. say that Maggie Gyllenhaal was weak as the love interest because I didn't buy her at all. And you, the you last point, agree. the I last know, I knew point, I would, I would agree with you there. I wasn't feeling her at all. A role like that, you need to get a Halle Berry, Beyonce, somebody. How about a Sonia Lathan, a Gabrielle Union, somebody like that, even a sister. Just throw them up. In there. Somebody fine. She wasn't. The study of film has been about class since the beginning. The Moscow Film School was the first university in the world to focus on film, established in 1919. This was an intellectual attempt to utilize a new medium for a new society for political purposes. Soviet montage theory was born, and now we know about the power of the cut. Cut to America in 1919. We have the greatest crime story in the history of baseball, the Black Sox scandal. The White Sox threw the 1919 World Series to the Reds for the Rothstein Gambling Syndicate. Sports narratives and cinema would never stop being about money and class, and montage would never stop bringing Marxism to the minds of film scholars. Now, these are going to just be a few examples, and I know I'm missing some major ones, but that's why I'm structuring this whole thing as a recurring series. I'll eventually do another part on individualism versus team camaraderie, uh, one on the joy of playing, and maybe I'll come back and do another one about class, because the cinema is always growing, and so is our knowledge of it. But for now, let's talk about sports movies and class struggle. In the early 30s, uh, I guess you could say the king of pre-code cinema was William Wellman before the censorship was codified in Hollywood, uh, this guy was cranking out pretty lusty movies at a very high rate. I would recommend all of them. I think Safe in Hell is probably my favorite, and The Public Enemy is the most iconic one. But College Coach from 1933 is the one I want to talk about. Uh, Pat O'Brien plays a ruthless college football coach who gets grades faked and pays ringer players to pretend to be students, and it really shocked me out of my complacency on first viewing. I mean, this was a film from the 1930s that was so ahead of its time about the scam that is college athletics. I watched this before all the NIL stuff started years ago, and now with players starting to get 
paying contracts and endorsement deals, there's just like a whole new set of corruption issues. It's not like everything was just solved. Um, this film ends with the coach apologizing for his corruption and winning a game and then offering to quit. But they all like the team and the college says, no, they're like, no, you're you learned your lesson and you're such a good coach that you should just stay. So not exactly a progressive ending, but the struggle is there. And it's also uh, pretty indicative of, you know, moral decision making in football and how those rules are going to be enforced over the next hundred years. Thank you. You moving your office, sir? Permanently, I'm afraid. Permanently? This uh, memo from the dean makes it fairly explicit. Curtailment of university expenses. Why, in other words, you're fired. That's right. Fired because my chair in chemistry depends on college funds. And unfortunately, those seem to depend on football revenue. Well, this work with you is all I came to college for. Your job, my life's ambition. Everything a university is supposed to stand for all goes by the board. Unless Calvert beats Shipley. The next one I want to talk about also from the pre-code era in the early 30s is King Vidor's The Champ. Now, I know boxing movies have been around longer than any other kind of sports movie, and so it's fitting to talk about one from the 30s. And this is much more of the direct approach to class struggle that the Moscow Film School would have appreciated. The champ and his kid, who is named Dink, go get drunk and gamble every night between his fights. The kid's mom is lucky enough to have a rich husband during the Depression. Uh, but, you know, the, the kid has to eventually go stay with her as his father is not fit for raising a child. But you have to think about it from the kid's perspective. That's what the film is asking you to do. And you want to know what's more worthwhile, being ringside for great fights and just barely scraping by financially or being comfortable, but being detached from the game you love. This is the perfect dichotomy of being a sports class film and also a love of the game film, which is another category that's often usually attempted in a way that's lazy and only succeeds when the direction is truly graceful, like it is here by King Vidor, one of the all-timers. Get your new suit and a pair of rubber boots. Real rubber boots? Real rubber boots and a shotgun. Say, a shotgun that goes kaploy and... Oh. Uh, Boy, we can swell. travel and we can go down to Paris, uh, Georgia, and Des Moines, Missouri. Yeah, Won't that be swell, yeah, huh? Boy. Oh, boy. Oh, what do we care? Oh. Uh, we're going to take a little trip across the globe here, uh, moving forward to 1957 for... Xi Jin's woman basketball player number five. This is a Chinese uh, Communist Party propaganda drama that shows the glorious nation taking on the glorious sport. It's fairly thin soup on a narrative level, but it's a great insight into the idea of the global game before the game had even really solidified itself here in the U.S. It's definitely more in the teamwork slash camaraderie vein than the class struggle vein, but it would be criminally short-sighted not to mention a CCP propaganda movie about basketball in this video. I think the guy needs to work on his form a little bit, especially if he wants to be the coach of the team. By 1985, Cold War chic had reached its peak in the U.S., and even Sly Stallone was invoking the struggles of the, the world versus capitalism with his masterpiece, Rocky IV. The USSR sends their best in Ivan Drago, but of course America will prevail. The most noteworthy thing about this installment in the Rocky series is, of course, the montage. All of the Rocky movies have a ton of montages, but this movie feels like one giant one. The dialectic of cutting between two fighters training is the cornerstone of combat sports movies, but the weight of the world truly feels like it's on the shoulders of this one.
Uh, moving over to baseball, which I think it probably lends itself to sports movies better than anything else, I want to talk a little bit about Ron Shelton's Bull Durham. This is another film that works as much as a class film as it is a lust film and a love of the game film. The tragedy of being a career minor leaguer and the comedy of beating a minor league mascot under the stadium lights carry an equal weight for me. The poetry of the game is in Bull Durham anytime someone throws a ball, and it'd be a good enough movie for that alone, but it dives so deep into its character psychology and has so many incredibly dumb but beautiful monologues that I just can't help but love it. What do you believe in then? Well, I believe in the soul. The cock, the pussy, the small of a woman's back, the hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, that the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, softcore pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. Good night. Oh, my. Now, sticking with the 1980s, Major League is the sports film that I probably grew up watching the most weirdly. Um, It's not nearly my favorite. My favorite would be the Bad News Bears, but this one was just on cable so often that the rhythms became nearly televisual in their repetition. This is the ultimate owner versus player movie, and I'm genuinely a little surprised that the MLB lent their likeness to a movie with this level of cruelty. With 2020 hindsight, the film almost seems to play into the Cleveland Indians mascot and aesthetic to a level of critique of the racist institution. The motivation to win is given in this scene, where a cardboard cutout of the female owner's clothes will be stripped away with each victory. What better to motivate a group of red-blooded American athletes than the promise of two-dimensional partial nudity? In 2019, Steven Soderbergh whipped out his iPhone and made a film explicitly about sports labor with High Flying Bird. I wish there was more than just the one one one-on-one game staged for a viral stunt in the way of actual sports on screen, but I respect the decision to completely dedicate this movie to what is referred to as the game on top of the game. Soderbergh was initially attached to Moneyball, a movie that I'll eventually get to in another video, but many saw this as his make-good product uh, to the world of sports. Andre Holland plays a basketball agent on the precipice of a lockout and his agency going under. The aforementioned viral stunt is, in the, is the leverage created for the players to showcase their potential financial quasi-independence by streaming independent games on Netflix or Hulu to exist without the league. Now, this is a complete crackpot idea, but it turns out that our protagonist knows that and never actually believes in it. He just knows that it could scare the league out of complacency because he knows it's all about their money. The book Revolt of the Black Athlete is shown at the end almost as a if you like this recommendation. And while the film's hints toward radicalism are of course stifled by their mere existence in a capitalist corporate megastructure, it's a very valiant effort in narrativizing ideological concerns that have to do with our beloved sports leagues. And that's what this whole video is about anyway, right? <laughs> You're supposed to sit on your ass and not at stupid things But man, that's hard to do If you don't, they'll screw you And if you do, they'll screw you too I'm landing in the middle of the diamond all alone play to win when it comes to skin and bone and sometimes I say things I shouldn't like and sometimes I say things I shouldn't like
Billy.